Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Lean Six Sigma, Driving Improvement in Your Healthcare Organization. I'm Maureen McKinney, the Content Director at Freesia, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. We chose today's topic because we know so many of you are looking for ways to be more efficient and drive improvement in your organizations while also enhancing quality in the patient experience. No easy task. To help you get there, we are so fortunate to have with us two great speakers who will share their insights and personal experiences with process improvement. First, we have Frank Cohen, Director of Analytics and Business Intelligence for Doctors Management, a healthcare consulting firm. Frank is an expert in applied statistics, predictive analytics, and process improvement strategies. He has a master black belt in Lean Six Sigma, and he's the author and co-author of several books, including Lean Six Sigma for the Medical Practice, Improving Profitability by Improving Processes. Next, we'll get some valuable firsthand experience from Gaynor Rosenstein. Gaynor is the Chief Clinical Operations Officer at Crystal Run Healthcare, a large multi-specialty group practice in New York State. Gaynor has held many senior administrative roles in healthcare organizations and is also a certified Six Sigma Black Belt. Before we turn the floor over to Frank, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is scheduled for one hour, including time for Q&A at the end of the session. At the bottom of your audience console, you'll see several application widgets. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A widget, and I'll ask as many questions as time allows. In the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen, you'll find slides from today's presentation, along with an overview of Freesia and one of our recent infographics about efficiency killers in healthcare organizations. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. And since it's always one of the most frequently asked questions, this session is being recorded and we will share a copy of the recorded presentation by the end of the week. We'll be live tweeting highlights from today's webinar. So be sure to follow Freesia on Twitter, at Freesia. If your practice is active on social media, you can retweet our updates, and we encourage you to share your own posts about what you hear today using hashtag Freesia webinars. A quick word about Freesia. Freesia gives healthcare organizations a suite of applications to manage the patient intake process. Our innovative SaaS platform engages patients in their care and provides a modern, consistent experience while enabling our clients to maximize profitability, optimize staffing, and enhance clinical care. To find out more about Freesia, visit freesia.com. And with that, I will turn it over to Frank Cohen. Frank? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So my name is Frank Cohen, and um, as the introduction goes, I am a, a specialist in what's called computational mathematics, which includes applied statistics and predictive modeling. And as part of that, I do a great deal of work in the area of process improvement, operational research, and the like. And I gotta tell you, I'm very excited about, about um, talking about this today. And, and the big reason is because we've got this whole push towards value-based care away from fee-for-service type models. And value-based care says that we have to do our best to take care of our patients in the most effective way that we possibly can, and as efficiently as we can, because as everybody knows, there's going to be less dollars uh, to go around. So I would start by asking you this question. What would you say is the primary responsibility of a healthcare organization? Just, just think about it for a second. What, what's the, the number one reason would you think the, the main goal or objective to what we do in practicing medicine? Now, when I ask this at a, at a conference and I can see people and they raise their hands, the majority of people will say it's to provide quality care to our patient population. And while I think that's important, I'm going to say that I think the primary responsibility is to be profitable. Because if you're not profitable, unless you're the federal government, you can't operate at a deficit for only so long before eventually you just go out of business. Well, how do we, how do we um, increase our profitability within a practice or at least maintain enough of a, profitable, uh, a profitability so that we're able to meet the, the um, requirements for providing quality health care? Well, one thing we can do 
is um, we can take a look at in improving profitability by either in improving our revenue, uh, generating additional revenue, or by reducing our expenses. And, and if you if you're in financial parts of your practice at all or management, you know that this is the basic concept behind profitability. <clears throat> it's a ratio of revenue to expenses. So we have to Im increase revenue. We have to decrease expenses. So how do we do that? Let's talk about that. Well, for reducing expenses, we could uh, cut staff pay and benefits. Raise your hands if you're okay with that, right? And I can't see you, but I can't imagine anybody has raised their hands because what happens if you lower staff um, compensation below market value? Well, people leave. They quit. They go to find new jobs. And when, when you have a high staff turnover because of that, um, what does that do to the quality of the continuity of care? It reduces the continuity of care. And when you reduce continuity of care, you also reduce quality of care. We can also eliminate FTEs. Uh, great example, we had a, a practice we were doing a project for, and what they did before we came in was they had five coders, and they all had to code, I think it was like 90 encounters a day or something like that. <clears throat> when Right before we came in, they eliminated two of them. So now they had three coders who had to code the same number of encounters as five coders did before that. Well, what happens? Well, we did, as part of a Lean Six Sigma project, we did a time assessment. So what we looked at was a time scale. In the beginning or, or in the first half of the day, they coded the same number of encounters, the three of them, each coded the same number of encounters as they coded when there were still five of them. But come the afternoon and the crunch was on, they started coding more and more and more until they were they were basically stumbling over each other, trying to code so many encounters during that time. Well, the result was that the error rate increased. So that when they would get denials, do denial analysis, they would find out that these, these codes were being denied because they were coding them improperly. They weren't um, providing the proper documentation or they weren't coding them based on the documentation they were getting because they didn't have the time to do so. <clears throat> the result was is that the cost of the errors was more than the cost of those two FTEs and bringing those two people back provided them with a more efficiency and more accuracy uh, overall. You can also pinch capacity. You could try to restrict, uh, I guess, the number of patients that you see, the services that you provide, but we're still in a fee-for-service market. And, and if you do that, you're simply going to cut uh, your nose off to spite your face. Reduce overhead. I haven't met uh, a practice administrator probably in the last five years who has any overhead left to cut. I think that we're pretty much down to the basic amount that we can be. The bottom line is quality is expensive. And if you reduce your expenses below the point of where you can afford quality care, then you're going to end up going out of business anyway. Well, we could increase revenues, right? We could increase our charges. But I mean, this amazes me. Have, have you noticed that healthcare is the only industry, I think, in the whole world where what you charge has absolutely nothing to do with what you earn, what your income is? I think that's like amazing, right? I've been in this industry. I've been in this industry for 40 years. I'm an old guy, and I got to tell you, I still sit in amazement that charges have almost nothing to do with reimbursement. Uh, you can increase collections, and that's pretty hard to do also because, look, the payers, the payers have a natural animus towards providers. I, you know, I, I don't care what they say. I, maybe I'm, I've done this long enough to be cynical enough to see the fact, but the payers, are, look, our primary purpose, not, not our responsibility, but our purpose is to get paid reasonably for providing quality health care to our patients. And the payers' primary goal is to not pay us for providing quality care to their 
subscribers. So it's very difficult to increase collections. You could negotiate better contracts. People go out and do that, but there's a point at which you can't negotiate any better contracts because the payers also have a limit as to where they're willing to go. So what a lot of people are doing is they're merging into larger groups. When you merge into larger groups, you can share certain expenses. And this is, by the way, a form of, of Lean Six Sigma. There are projects that are designed in order to do this, where you know you, you share administration, you share billing services, you share infrastructure and hardware, and there can be certain efficiencies in that. Uh, the bottom line, though, is that the practice has very little influence over those payments and therefore over the revenues. So if we can only marginally affect expenses, right, and there's really not much we can do on, on revenue, how do we improve profitability? Well, we have to become more efficient. And to become more efficient, what we're basically saying is that we want to do the same that we're doing now with less resources, or we want to be able to do more with the same amount of resources. I, I have a, I had a, um, a radiology group. We did a couple projects for them and we significantly increased their uh, efficiency. And what they decided was they just wanted to work less. Basically, they didn't want to make more money. They just wanted to work less. So they worked less and they still made the same amount. Their revenues were still basically the same and their, their compensation was the same as a result of that. And the only way to become more efficient or Let's say this maybe shouldn't say the only way. The best way that I know of to become more efficient is to uh, employ Lean Six Sigma um, projects or techniques. Now, as you might guess, Lean Six Sigma is a composite. It comes from two basic components or two um, paradigms. Six Sigma is a, is a very um, robust but very... Uh, top heavy, or it's got a large footprint. Six Sigma projects usually take many months or years. They involve large numbers of team members, and they're very expensive. And, and I'm just going to tell you my experience. I don't think I've ever seen a Six Sigma project um, succeed in a smaller organization. Granted, in large hospital systems or in, uh, integrated delivery systems, I've seen lots of Six Sigma projects work. But in, in smaller practices or, or departments, Six Sigma doesn't seem to work as well. It is, it is very focused on analytics and statistics, a great deal of rigor in that area. Lean, on the other hand, does not rely as much on the statistical and analytical rigor. What it does, it looks more at the process model. What are we doing and how are we doing it? And um, what steps are we taking? And how can we minimize uh, some of the, the functions and procedures that we go through on a daily basis in order to do our jobs? Now, lean, the whole concept is to get rid of waste. Anything that's that and waste is defined as anything that doesn't contribute to either the value of the services being provided to the patient or of the employees of the organization. If there's no value that can be found in a certain step or a procedure or a process or a function, then unless it's required by law or regulation or policy, we get rid of it. It's basically what it is. Lean Six Sigma is this continuum. And and I happen to be a fan of of really focusing on, or at least relying upon analytics to a great degree in the lean process. Because look, number one, we have to define the problem, and oftentimes without numbers, we can't do it. For, for, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if I were to ask you right now, uh, how many of you have patients that are late? And I assume everyone just about would raise their hands. And I'd ask you this question, is that a problem for you? And most people will say, yes, I've done this where I can see the audience. And, and so the question is, define for me late. How many minutes after or, or how many minutes after what? Is it the, when they were scheduled? Is it after 15 minutes before the scheduled time? How do you define late? And then I would ask you this. Based on that definition, how many of you right now, if I asked you in a poll, could tell me what percentage of your patients are late every month? And I can tell you again, just from doing this live, very few people could report that. So my question is, how do you know it's a problem if you don't know how late people are and you don't know what percentage of people are late? 
we say that because it's an it's anecdotal. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's logical that if people don't show up on time for their appointments, that would be problematic. But maybe it's not problematic in this particular practice. And so we we I believe we have to employ strong and robust analytics, even in the lean side of it, in order for things to happen. I'll show you what I mean in just a minute. So the reason we want to have this problem or this process focus is so that primarily we can understand how things work. We can take a look at, at the practice and we can look at all the different aspects of it and we can start to, to understand better um, um, what the processes are, what the steps are in each of those processes. We want to be able to see it from start to finish. You know what happens a lot of times is we'll go into a practice and we'll say, oh, let's, let's go ahead and start, you know, process mapping this out. I'll get into that in just a minute. <clears throat> and uh, what people will do is, is they will develop a map of how they think it should be, right? Because they know there's problems. I mean, it's really amazing. I, I'll go to a conference and I'll have a thousand people in the room and I'll ask this question. How many of you right now, if I give you a piece of paper, could write down at least three or four major problems within your organization? And everybody would raise their hand. So write them down, right? You write down these three problems. And then the, my question would be, if you know that it's a problem, why is it still a problem? If I could write down and tell you, for example, in my business, the problem is that I don't follow up appropriately with my clients and therefore I lose the opportunity for repeat business business. I mean, that's crazy. If I write that down on a piece of paper and I can see that that's my problem, why in the world haven't I fixed that problem? And a lot of times it's because we don't have this process focus. We don't get to the root cause of things. We, and instead, what we do is we blame people for messing up rather than understanding the idea that maybe we don't have the most efficient process that there is. So there is a combination of art and science in this. Lean there's a very sort of artistic component to lean. It, it, if you do projects correctly, they're actually quite beautiful, just like mathematics, you know, can be very beautiful at its core. But there's also the science part, which we're going to talk about with regard to, um, to the analytics. So let's, let's start with this idea of discovery. So there's th three components we'll talk about here. We're talking about classification, correlation, and cause and effect. And those three um, associate to the first three or the three most important, what I believe to be tools, which is process mapping, value stream mapping, and then doing fishbone diagrams or cause and effect analysis. So we start with, with this classification. And what we're trying to do is just take a look around and see what things look like. How do people move? Um, what redundant events do we see going on? Are the things that are being done manually that can be automated? Uh, for example, this is one area where we find a lot of times that in, in areas where you have more sophisticated populations of patients, you can use kiosks instead of coming in and getting a clipboard and everybody writing all that information down. It's a pain to do it that way. Um, so th that's one thing that you can see, things you can see right away. Here's an example. Uh, one time, whenever I do a project, I like to sit in the waiting room, just hours. I'll sit there for three, four, five, six hours with a uh, pencil and a piece of paper. And I'm taking notes, and I notice something. I notice that, uh, particularly for new patients that were coming in, they get this whole big packet of information. They would get up, and they would go to the desk several times, filling out the packet, and they would come back and sit down. So eventually I went up to the desk and I asked uh, one of the, I asked this guy who was behind the desk in the, in the intake part of it. And I said, you know, I see all these people coming up asking questions. What are they asking? And he said, well, a lot of them, um, they don't understand the financial forms. So they want us to clarify it for them. And some of them, they can't see, um, they can't read the, what it says. Why is that? Well, it's an older population. And they forget their reading glasses. It was really quite amazing. So I got up. I went to a Sam's Club. They had one down the street. And I bought 20 pair of reading glasses in different strengths in a really nice little basket. And I put the basket on the counter. And there was a little sign that says, need reading glasses? And, of course, we made the, the print, the wording very big so the people who didn't have glasses need them could read it reading glasses take one and and it was amazing and we caught what we believe when we measured about seven minutes off the time it took for someone to do an intake for a new patient visit just by observing what went on within the waiting room 
Um, uh, another example was we had a case where um, this is in Florida, elderly patient. So a, a normal adult will walk at somewhere around 5.2 to 5.6 feet per second, whereas an older person or somebody who may have some debilitation walks down towards the 2.6 to 2.8 feet per second range. And what we noticed was that all the physician's offices were up in the front of this big U-shaped building, <coughs> and the treatment rooms were in the back. So the, they had to take the patients and walk them all the way past, all the way to the back to the treatment rooms. And we estimated that it cost a little over two minutes per patient visit. Well, when you have several hundred patient visits a day, that's the equivalent of seeing an additional eight or ten patients a day. So what we did was we rearranged the building, moved the offices around, and were able to solve that problem. So we want to look and see what things look like. And that's what process mapping is about. So I mapped the process. The patient checks in. If it's a new patient, for example, they have to do intake forms. If it's not, <coughs> excuse me, then it's a doctor's visit. Um, uh, is there a visit check-in? Uh, no, then, they, then maybe they just have to go to the lab or something, whatever the process might be. Uh, same thing here. Um, this is for a lab study itself. And so we map out the process, which simply identifies each of the individual steps in in the entire process as to what we're doing. Now, a lot of times what people will do is, is we'll want to we'll map the whole patient um, visit process. We want to do from when the patient walks in the door to when the patient leaves. But what you have to know is that within that, there are sub-processes. So for example, this whole idea of check-in can be broken down into a sub-process. If you're listening to me right now and you work in the check-in or at the front desk, you know for a fact it's not just one little bubble check-in, and that's it. It is broken down into many parts. There's insurance verification. Uh, does the patient owe any money from the last visit? Is there a copay that has to be collected this time? Um, are there any particular issues? Are there demographics changed? Has their insurance policy changed? Um, you know, just a whole host of things. And so just be careful when you do this not to map too much. So in this case, we're just looking at an overview map, but, but, you know, we don't have time in this presentation, but we get into detailed maps, and in a patient visit cycle alone, the throughput cycle, there can be a dozen different detailed processes that need to be looked at. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. All right. So the next thing we want to do is we want to understand this concept of correlation. Now, correlation is actually a, a mathematical conclusion. Correlation uses a... Um, uh, um, a calculation in order to determine how closely related certain events might be. For example, um, um, engine size uh, versus gas mileage would be negatively correlated. The larger the engine, the less gas mileage I would get. That's pretty easy to see, right? Um, for example, I can tell you that the longer the time it takes for a new patient to get an appointment at the practice, the higher the number of no-shows. And after a three-week period, if it takes more than three weeks for a new patient to get in to see the doctor, then that no-show period is going to expand significantly. <clears throat> so those things are important to me. Now, the question is, you know, does, um, does that time cause the no-show? Or is there, is there some other confounding variable involved in that? That's something that we look at when we, um, when we look at the cause and effect part of it. But this is a part, okay? So um, um, I'll give you an example. Um, this is where we can actually save ourselves time and effort. I had a, a rural practice. I think it was out in Missouri. And uh, they had got a new administrator. <coughs> it, was, it was a dozen physicians, so it was a pretty good size. And this new administrator was this um, uh, had an MBA or MHA and, and had worked at a large practice in the city and came in with all these great ideas. And the first thing that he wanted to do was to take their intake process for new patients and move it to the internet. So they spent a huge amount of money on this on a HIPAA certified, secured web site and and all that, and then you could go online and fill out the intake forms online, and they were pushed through. And all. 
the problem was they weren't getting any, nobody was doing it, maybe 30%, 20% of the patients. Well, that's not enough when you spend that kind of money. When we came in to look at doing some other work for them, we did a survey, and we found out that fewer than 50% of the patients, as a matter of fact, it was like 41%, had access to the Internet, and of those, only half accessed it regularly. <clears throat> and obviously, this is many years ago, and again, it was a rural area, but had they stopped and even thought about looking at some of those aspects, asking those questions in advance, um, they would have correlated those two items, then they would have had a much better chance at saving that money. Um, in building this, this correlation part, we want to also build inspection points. They're actually kind of, <coughs> excuse me, kind of interesting. So here's where, you know, an order from chemo, and then it says order printed from the mosaic system. Uh, the codes are uh, handwritten on the order to each drug, and then, you know, pre-med fluids removed from Lynx. This is, Lynx is one of their systems. It goes to the nurse before compounding. This is for chemotherapy, by the way. This is a, a big cancer center that we worked on. So all items are placed in a basket and set in the counter. And what, what the purpose of this is, is we can look at what happens in each one of those individual steps. Because we want to be able to uh, create contingency plans in case things go wrong, but we want everyone to be on the same page and have a better understanding. And it's not often, really, if you think about it, even from a management perspective, where we break things down to this level of granularity, and it's really important to do so. Here's an example of um, an INR clinic where they're doing um, <coughs> anticoagulant blood testing. And, and you can see we added some numbers. For example, 30% of appointments are no-shows. Okay, we found out that 60 percent of people come by car and 40 percent by public transportation. One of the big problems is that the car, lot, the parking lot is full. So what do people do? They leave and they go home. Right. Um, there may be waits of 15 to 30 minutes to get this done or in the waiting area <coughs> when they're sent to the wait. Once they're in the waiting area, it could be an hour, an hour and a half till they have to wait for the results to determine what the dosages are going to be. So, so this is a situation where we found out that the biggest problem was transportation, right? Um, people either couldn't park or they couldn't afford it or they had to take public transportation. It wasn't overly reliable. So here's what we did. First, we checked with the OIG, make sure this wasn't incentivizing um, against stark rules. What we did, we went to a, the, the cab company, local taxi company, and we said, hey, we want to make a deal with you. We want to arrange a set of concentric circles. So here's the hospital, and we draw a circle three miles out. We draw another circle seven miles out. We draw another circle 10 miles out, because most people were within a 10-mile radius of the facility. And what we said was, if they can't make it in, you know, we, we would call to verify the appointment. If they can't, if they have problems with transportation, then you go pick them up, and we'll pay X amount of dollars for the three mile, X amount of dollars for the seven, X amount of dollars for the 10. And we worked this deal out with the cab company. Now, it cost us about $45,000 the first year, but we lost $300,000 the year before in no-shows, the organization did. And so it was a tremendous boost for them. And how did it happen? We just looked around, we just saw things, and we said, hey, how come people aren't showing up for these appointments? Well, the only way you're going to know that is if you call them and ask them. So we did. And, and we did a survey of those folks, and we came up with these information. <clears throat> and finally, we want to do this cause and effect relationship. We want to be able to link things together. So I know you've heard this before. The, the typical or the sort of stereotypical example is the rooster crows and the sun rises. You know, does the rooster crowing cause the sun to rise, or does the sun rising cause the rooster, cause the rooster to crow, or is there no relationship between them at all? You know, like, for example, your payer mix changes. Maybe you you lose a certain payer and the payer mix shifts, and you lose revenue at the same time. That may be correlated, but did the change in that payer mix cause that change in revenue, or were there other variables or confounding variables uh, involved? We talked about the length of time to appointment, right? Gets longer and our no-shows increase. But does the length of time to appointment cause those no-shows. And the way we find these things out is by using teams. We get those subject matter experts, the people within your organization who know the most about what's going on, and we get them together and we ask them those questions, right? And we try to determine it. Here's a simple one. We have a long wait time for new patients. We're trying to figure out why is that happening. Well, is it, is it a wave scheduling problem? Uh, maybe we're not doing phone triage. And so people call with really complex problems, and we put them in the same 15-minute or 30-minute time slot as somebody who calls that doesn't have complex problems. Maybe it's the time of the visit. 
We tested that. We did an analysis where we took one patient <clears throat> at the beginning of each hour for one for a whole week, and then we did it for a month. We went across, and we said, does the time of day uh, have any relationship to being late? And we found out, no, it didn't. One of the big problems were unnecessary forms. They had, they had an ABN in every one. People would read through it and sign it. I don't even think that's legal. You know, um, they also did manual insurance validation when people got there instead of ahead of time. So they're sitting on the phone for a long time waiting to talk to the insurance company. And we also thought, well, it's because they're elderly patients. You know, well, that wasn't the case. They would get there early. So we found out that the forms in the intake packet was a big problem. And what do we do? We tested a few different intake packages. We went through and we, we for example, we went from the, the um, clipboard. That's a pain, right? You have a clipboard, you take the paper out, you got to turn over right on the back. By the time you get done, it's a mess. We went to three ring binders and we found that that saves several minutes of time, not just for people filling out the forms, but also for the check in the front office staff not to have to go through and resort all that paperwork. And we also did it so that they could be scanned in using scanners and that saved significant amounts of time for those data that had to be transferred back into an electronic um, system. Um, all right, here's a more complex one. This is one where we had um, <coughs> problems with nosocomial infections within an organization. We're trying to figure out why. This was an interesting one because I sat and observed and everybody washed their hands, right, all the time. They took off their gowns. They changed everything. Could not figure out for the life of us what was causing this. However, uh, we did. And what we ended up finding out the problem was was that the physicians, even though they scrubbed up and wore masks and changed gowns, when they went from one treatment room to another to see a patient, the stethoscope that they used, they never disinfected the diaphragm of the stethoscope. And we actually cultured some of those diaphragms, and we found there was MRSA um, and VERSA on some of those um, uh, diaphragms. And so that was one way that we were able to resolve the problem, by doing a cause and effect and eliminating those things that weren't true. So here's how first-level problem solving goes. We have a practical problem, practical solution. You have an employee that shows up late and goes home early and doesn't do their work. You don't need to go through a Lean Six Sigma process, form a committee, and decide what you're going to do. The person's either retrained or gone. A mosquito lands on your arm. You don't stop, take a picture, go to Google, you know, do a lookup, find out what kind of mosquito it is. You swat it, and you get rid of it. The house catches on fire. You don't take time to determine the, the burn time on combustible materials. You run, right? But most of the problems that we deal with are not that simple. So what I'm proposing in this presentation is that we take practical problems and we convert them to analytical problems first. And then we find an analytical solution like we've talked about here, and then we convert that to a practical solution like this. This is my life, okay, uh, except <clears throat> this is a few years old. And now what you'll find is that the looking for things I had just a minute ago tend to be a little bit farther into my sleeping part of it. And I find that the eating cuts into my working a little bit. And it's just sort of a way for us to define what things look like in a graphical sense. So takeaways, <clears throat> number one, lean is scalable. I don't care if you're one physician or a thousand physicians, it works the same. One of the big ones is think small. So if you're thinking of looking at doing a throughput analysis, start with just wait time. That's it. Or look at just the patient interview process or just the insurance verification or just the checkout process. If you're thinking about looking at all your patients, just do one week's worth of patients. Think small because if you go too big and the project fails, you're not going to want to do it in the future. Antidote, not anecdote. Always include evidence-based decision modeling, which requires the use of data and evidence. Also, be sure to define the end of the project. Because if you don't do that, you're going to end up two years from now going, oh, man, we're still working on the same thing. And also think outside the box. And what that means primarily is don't be constrained to the same solutions you've used in the past. I think it was Albert Einstein says that we can't use the same solutions we've used before with the same problems and expect that they're going to work. Get creative. Get excited. Get together and, and talk about things that make no sense whatsoever because you would be surprised sometimes at how the wildest ideas uh, turn out <coughs> to be um, something positive. And that's my time.
uh, thank you very much. I, I hope you enjoyed this and, uh, and moving on. Thank you for a great presentation, Frank. And now I will turn it over to Gaynor Rosenstein. Gaynor? Hi, everyone. So thank you, Frank. That was great. Um, so I'm the Chief Clinical Operations Officer here at Crystal Run Healthcare. We're a multi-specialty um, physician practice in upstate New York. I've listed out some, just some facts about Crystal Run just to give you some kind of a context. But we're approximately, we're, we're over 400 providers. We have about 20 locations and we have full ambulatory services. So for us, I totally agree with Frank with the differences between Six Sigma and Lean. And I tend to consider Lean as the practical application of Six Sigma. And that's really my, for, for operations and for really rapidly advanced and improvement, I've found Lean to be very, very useful. And today, and just in the interest of time, I'm looking at um, hopefully getting through this in 10 minutes. So I'm not going through every detail of each slide, but you will have these slides available to you. And I want to talk about what we did with a building that we built in Newburgh, New York in 2015. We opened, and this was a very innovative building that we used lean design to design both the physical space and the workflows that uh, were necessary to change in order to uh, really meet our goals of having a much more um, lean environment, driving out waste, et cetera, et cetera. So this was really a practical application of a lot of lean principles. It was also a very rapid process. Um, we had, it was approximately from beginning to end, the design phase of the building was approximately three months. So this was very rapid. Um, this is a 66,000 square feet, two-story uh, building that houses approximately 40 specialties and probably anything from 40 to 50 physicians at one time. Plus, we have endoscopy, infusion, urgent care, and diagn diagnostic imaging and lab. So that's kind of just to give you a picture of what this building is housing. And we wanted to do something different. We wanted to um, really build a building that was focused much more on flexibility, on the ability to, um, to really reduce wait time for patients, wasted time for staff, whether it's in supply management, whether it's in check-in, check-out, et cetera. And we wanted to be different. And, and honestly, we wanted to differentiate ourselves in the market. And in order to do this, we um, we started out with focus teams. I've listed them out there, but these were really our teams that were looking specifically at their areas and their specialties because they are different and uh, looking at how we can improve our workflows and our processes and depending on that, how we would actually design a building to support that. And the physical design really turned out to be very, very critical in whether or not these new workflows would work or not. So value stream mapping, um, uh, Frank did talk about that a little bit. We did do this. Uh, we had our goals for redesign, and I've listed them all there. They were lofty goals. And we had every single one of those teams go through an intense value stream mapping process, all the way from patient scheduling, all the way to the receipt of the revenue. So we did include the billing portion, we included the coding portion, and we included our, our, our call center. Where Crystal Run has their own call center. Um, and we included that portion of it as well for the patient scheduling fees. And the things that we really focused on was driving out the waste relating to wait time, uh, improving efficiency in that, patient satisfaction. Physician engagement is a real um, focus for us. Uh, obviously, we are a medical practice, so that's something that is a national issue. So we want to do all that we can to improve that. And again, just listing out there, but the big things for us was really to promote flexibility so that we can be flexible with the types of specialties that can work in these spaces and standardize wherever possible. And standard work was a huge goal for us across the board. Um, we went through a intense 3P process, production preparation process. For, for those lean folks among us. And basically what we did, we built cardboard mock-ups, um, full scale of the new design. We were fortunate that we had a floor free in, a, in a, a, like a 20,000 foot uh, floor space that we could utilize. 
and I've listed out all the areas that we actually mocked up. And this this was fun. I mean, this this stuff was really fun. We had the architect sitting with the teams, um, and the teams were, you know, staff positions. Everybody who does the actual work was there. And this was based on the work that they'd done in the value stream map, where they decided that we need to do things quite differently. And this portion was to design the actual architectural floor plan and the space. And they built cardboard sinks, they built cardboard. It was very creative. And we did a lot of role playing and uh, we did them. I've listed all the areas that we did this for and the specialties. Uh, urology actually was the only one that ended up having a very different space uh, because the uh, procedure room needed to be bigger. But other than that, the architect actually sat with the teams throughout the whole three month process and um, revised and modified the CAD drawings and designed the space basically on the fly. So this was, people were pushing out walls, they were bringing in, um, we worked closely with Midmark as well, and they, we would actually bring in equipment so that we could plan the space and make it efficient. The things that we focused on in terms of workflow redesign, and it's, it's, it's absolutely true that designing the building was extremely fun. Workflow, workflow redesign is rarely fun. It's actually hard. And uh, especially when you have people who are, um, change is not easy, you know. And again, we are a physician practice, and uh, our workflows actually did impact pretty significantly our providers, our nursing staff, et cetera, et cetera. And the things that, the workflows that we completely redesigned, I've listed here. Um, we did talk a little bit about uh, uh, insurance verification, things like that. It's very, very important that we do a very rapid check-in. Uh, Freesia has been a great help to us for that. We have kiosks that also run the Freesia. And uh, so we're really looking at rapid check-in. We check people out in the room, the technology for that. Um, we had to, we switched from, we removed all fee tickets all of our charge entries real time, and we really push for real time uh, charting on the EMR, et cetera, et cetera. And I do need to add in terms of physician engagement, one of our big goals was to, we measured the amount of time that physicians were working at night based on how long they were logged on for. And we tried to, re and we did make a huge effort to reduce that, and that was successful. Um, for example, we discharge all of our patients in the exam room. They do not wait on a checkout line. And there was a lot of workflow redesign that needed to be done to make all these things happen. Um, so where are we now? Uh, 30, we're 30 months in uh, this particular building in 2017, so over 200,000 visits. They are now consistently in 2018 seeing 1,100 visits per day. Um, we've built two more buildings uh, since then that we opened in 2016. They're fully operational. Um, in two different areas, and there's been absolutely no change in design or workflow. So that tells you the fact that we didn't change anything when we could have, that we didn't regret the changes that we made in the Newburgh office. Um, in the practice as a whole, these three buildings are commonly known to everyone as the lean buildings and the lean sites, and our traditionally designed sites are commonly known as the legacy buildings. So this has become a part of our everyday language. They are, um, people like to work in them, providers like to work in them, and it is, they're quite different. But the use of the lean principles and how to build this building and change all the workflows were absolutely essential. And uh, I can certainly um, attest to that, that this was a very successful uh, project for us. Um, it was a little scary before we opened, and, uh, but it was definitely, it paid off, and it, it worked for us very, very nicely. I could talk forever on this, but in the interest of time, I think uh, my time is about up. So Maureen, back to you. That was great, Gaynor. Thank you so much for that, I think, really valuable firsthand uh, perspective and insight for the audience. So the great news is now after two really good presentations, we can begin the Q&A portion of our webinar. So we've got some great questions coming in, but a reminder, you can submit questions at any time during this session using the Q&A widget on your screen that I talked about at the beginning of the webinar. So to start, um, Gaynor, you mentioned that 
this was a huge workflow change for your providers. How did you get buy-in from your clinical staff when you had these really significant workflow changes? Really to focus on the, the overall long-term goals. Um, we did an awful lot of including providers and staff in the design of the space. When they were actually part of the value stream mapping process, this became their project. They were very, very engaged in it. People became very excited about it. And more, it was really because they were included from the ground up. And, uh, and also the use of data, um, I think that was a huge um, advantage where you were actually measuring check-in time, check-out time, that kind of a thing. But the, the, I would say the single most critical uh, piece was uh, very strong leadership in the sense of really focusing on the vision of where we wanted to be, why we wanted to be there, why we want to differentiate, and how this can help us do that. That's great. I just had a question from the audience come in that I think is a good follow-up to that. Um, and the audience question is, that it would be great to see a beginning to end patient encounter in one of your lean buildings. But since we can't see it, could you just briefly describe what that patient encounter looks like? And I know it varies by specialty, but maybe just give us some ideas of how it's a bit different. Sure, it's actually fairly vanilla across the specialties. So let, let's, let's take it from when a patient actually enters the building, someone who's scheduled. So they can either check in at a centralized front desk. We don't have decentralized front desk areas. We have one common area. And uh, they will check in there. That is automatic. Or they can check in at the kiosk. That's another option. Um, either way, the uh, nursing staff will be notified that they've arrived. The, they will be directed to a pause area. Uh, we don't have any waiting rooms in this building. There are basically chairs around the main hallways that are pause areas. The patient will go there, the staff within the suite, and you have to think in terms, it's difficult to do this without looking at the design of the building, but the staff in the suite are all working together in a centralized pod uh, in the offstage area, and around them are all the exam rooms, and all exam rooms have two doors. So the, the nursing assistant or the uh, LPN or the nurse or the RM will go out and pull the patient into the room, room the patient in the room. We have all the vitals in the room. The workstation is in the room. Uh, and we use a very, a pretty sophisticated light system so they can reserve the room using the lights when it's time for the physician or the uh, nurse practitioner, when it's time for the provider. So they will start out rooming the patient. They will then notify by the light system that they're ready for the doc. And then the doctor will go in. Everything can be charted in the room. Every room has a workstation and a printer. So the key is, is that nobody has to walk very far to get anything, and it's all very efficient. The light system will tell a provider who's next, and uh, they can literally bounce from room to room to room, and it's very efficient. Um, once the provider is done, they can uh, the uh, medical assistant or the nurse will go in and discharge the patient and uh, schedule their next appointment right while they're in the room. And then the patient leaves and goes home. So it's very, very, uh, they love that. That's very uh, key. And the physicians and nurses and uh, schedulers and the support staff, unit clerks, are actually all working together within the center of the suite. And the, again, they're surrounded by the exam rooms. So uh, there's no private offices. There are no private workspaces. Um, so that's quite different, too. So. It's very difficult to Thanks for that of, overview. Uh, picture it, yeah. No, I think you did a really great job. I think I think it's a really nice overview for everybody and I think really helpful. Frank, I've got lots of questions coming in for you as well. Um, so here's one. Uh, I have a lot of possible projects in mind. How do I decide which one to pick first? Uh, great question because um, we run into that <clears throat> A lot. It, that, that really crosses two areas. The first is, um, what's, what do you think is causing you the most pain? And one of the ways you can do that is you could start by process mapping out everything and then looking at, at the, the processes that are the most complex or the ones that are the least complex. And like I told you, I always like to start small 
pick something that's really easy to deal with or maybe easy to fix. And there's a couple reasons for this. You know, one of the questions that, that uh, came into Ms. Gaynor was about um, getting buy-in from leadership. If you, like, bite off a huge project and it takes lots of time and resources and money and it fails, no one's ever going to let you do it again. Start with a small project. Show small successes, and you'll, you'll start to get buy-in from leadership a lot better. So one way is to start by mapping it and to look look – look at which ones uh, may be most easily solved by the staff. The other is you want to include your subject matter experts. <clears throat> you want to include those team members that may have a better or the best understanding of what's going on. I often find that the administrators know the least about what's going on within their own organization. You want to know what's going on in check-in? Don't ask the administrator. Ask the people in check-in. If you're doing radiology and you want to know why it takes long to turn around a room, don't ask the administrator. Go talk to the people who have to turn the rooms around or the transportation folks or whatever. You know, so, so make sure you're talking to the right people and make sure you start with a broad map. So to build on that question, if, you know, if you're thinking about the organizations that you've worked with, what, is some, what are some examples of great low-hanging fruit, you know, this really great contenders for lean projects? Okay, great low-hanging fruit is um, is patient throughput. So uh, the check-in process. Again, kiosks are, are one of the best ways that I know of in order to help make this process more efficient. That's a, a great place to start is by looking at eliminating the front-end um, time that's required just to get a patient checked into the office. Uh, so that's, that's a great one to start. Also looking at, <coughs> at the... Um, the patient flow time. So once a patient is is there and checks in, you know, how do we resolve issues of too long of a wait time or not getting enough patients in, overbooking? And that's a place where scheduling works really well. Here's, here's my approach to it. Um, we actually just finished a project for a large health system uh, up in, in Michigan. And it's something like this where um, if you're not booking patients close enough, you hear that sucking sound, that's a physician waiting to see a patient. That is huge waste, particularly financially. If you have too many patients booked together, then people leave and you lose revenue that way as well. <coughs> Plus patient satisfaction goes down. So what we do is we do the same type of booking algorithms that the airlines use for overbooking. We look at, I do an analysis, let's say for a whole month, and I say, which time slots, and I break them into four, early morning, late morning, early afternoon, late afternoon, which time slots have the highest number of, let's say, no-shows, right? What days have the highest number of no-shows? And then I schedule my overbooks on those days and times for those providers. And if I do it right, only about 5% of the time will I really have an overbook. So, again, that's another great place that you can look at is in the scheduling um, in order to uh, uh, to make those improvements. Turnaround time is another big one. If you're an ASC or an imaging center, one of the biggest wastes is the amount of time it takes to turn a room around for the next patient. Um, for example, we had one in an ASC where the room has to be mopped and disinfected. Well, it was about a five-minute round trip for the person to go get the mops and, and the chemicals and everything to do it. So instead, we have a storage closet now centered between those ASCs and we cut about four minutes out of each of those turnaround times. If you're doing, you know, 15, 20 procedures a day, that's two extra patients. And there's a lot of revenue in that. So those are just some examples, uh, Maureen. <coughs> Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, Gaynor, I have a question uh, for you. Can you talk a bit more about your project goal of staff flexibility, what you mean by that, and what kind of successes you were able to achieve in that area? Yeah, this was really quite simple in terms of the standard work for rumen guidelines, et cetera. We really fo focused on the clinical staff for this because, frankly, the front desk staff are, are, are standardized anyway. They, they really weren't a problem. But the clinical staff, especially between specialties, that we needed to do some standard work in terms of rumen, discharge in, appointment making prior to the patient leaving, et cetera. So that was... Once we determined the standard work for that and trained everyone, the beauty is, is when somebody calls out, you can flex, you, you can cover. 
and uh, people can work in different specialties, they can work in different suites. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility with our staff. Another thing that was really important for us is flexibility of space, uh, same way as the staff, where we, we actually had um, our, our, all of our drawers in every one of the exam rooms is portable. So we can move the entire drawers out. There's no upper cabinets. And that creates, so I can turn one room into a urology room in seconds just by moving the, the portable drawers. So things like that. But the staff really was focused on standard work so that they can cover other positions when we need, uh, when we get call outs, if, we're, if we have vacancies, really having that flexibility so that our staff can cover other specialties without uh, really struggling. And Gaynor, is there um, a plan to roll out lean uh, to other sites in your organization? I know when they're not constructed in sort of the lean way that might be challenging, but are you using lean principles just to maybe do just do lean projects at your other sites as well? We do. Um, in terms of, you know, creating the, the overall effect of the lean buildings and the legacy buildings, that would require an, a really huge lift on the construction and redesign. We, there are areas that we've put workstations in the actual uh, patient rooms and things like that. So we've used some of the principles in our legacy buildings, but it's almost, you almost, to get the overall effect, you almost have to do the, it's the physical design that's very, very limited for that. And uh, so we've had some success in expanding some of our lean principles to our legacy offices, but unless we really redesign the space, the physical space itself, it's very limited in what we can do. Sure. Of course, we do small lean projects. I mean, those are, you know, these were huge, um, you know, frankly, multi-million dollar projects that were, were very exciting and big, but we do small lean projects all the time, just with value stream mapping out processes in, in many areas. And I find that, you know, the key thing is, like um, Frank stressed, is you got to get the people who do the work in the room because you have no idea what's going on. And unless you ask the people that are actually doing the work, um, you're not going to get a really true sense of what your processes really are. And it's quite surprising. It's always surprises me. What, what they're doing to get things done sometimes is, is uh, incredible, the workarounds. Frank, I've got one for you. Um, this person says, I work for a small practice and I'm kind of the whole team. Can I do a project like this myself? Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, start with small stuff. Look at, look at scheduling issues or um, uh, wait time. I mean, I always like to start projects like that. So what you can do, for example, is just in, in a one week's time, just take a look at the first patient for every hour of the day, see what time they're scheduled and what time do they actually get sent back, and just do a wait time analysis. Now, all you're looking for is to find out what's the average wait time, does that wait time increase throughout the day? Um, so, you know, for example, I, you know, I had a practice where patients, the doctor wanted patients in early, 8 o'clock, he wanted them scheduled. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, by 10 o'clock, we already got significant wait times. Why? Because the doctor doesn't show up till 8.30, which is ridiculous if you're going to try to schedule patients for 8 o'clock, you know. And, and sometimes you can fix those problems. But in this case, the you know, small practice physician owned the practice. What are you going to tell them, you know? Stop doing it or you're not going to be able to work here anymore. So if you're by yourself, pick small projects and just take little bites one at a time. I could pick a team of 10 people and do a complete throughput analysis in 30 days. Or I could take one person and do the same throughput analysis in 180 days. It doesn't matter because you're just doing smaller parts as you go through it. So just don't get discouraged and think that you got to have some big team of people to make these things work. You know, big projects, big teams, small projects, small teams. It's basically what it is. Well, I think that's all the questions we have time for today, and I want to sincerely thank Frank Cohen and Gaynor Rosenstein for their engaging presentations. It was great. And thanks to all of our attendees for joining today's webinar. Again, you will receive an email with a recording of today's webinar. You can also access the, the slides for today's webinar and other resources 
in the resources tab. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.